Coming to you from Brick House in downtown Brooklyn, this is 112BK. On the show today, congressional candidate Max Rose vying for a Republican seat and a Brooklyn conference on black literature. Hi, thanks for joining us today. I'm Ashley Ford. The Brooklyn brand took a beating over the weekend in what amounts to a controversy over cow chest. Let me explain. There was a tweet that went out with a question. Why is Brooklyn Barbecue taking over the world? It came from Vice's food website, Munchies, with a link to an article actually written in 2014 where the author describes finding barbecue restaurants in far-flung places that claim they got their inspiration, no, not from Texas, Kansas City, or Memphis, but from Brooklyn. You could replace barbecue with almost any other commodity skinny jeans, beard balm, Korean tacos, or fair trade coffee beans. We do seem to be good at bastardizing or appropriating things, like barbecue, or dressing like a lumberjack, when clearly our inspiration comes from elsewhere. Perhaps we became the clearinghouse with all of the kitsch and copycatting. We have a special take on some of this stuff, but to be honest, it mostly feels like buying gifts at the airport. But back to pork butt or cow chest, which is where brisket comes from. This nod to Brooklyn barbecue has the actual barbecue capitals a buzz, and they're responding with a little bit of, oh no, you didn't, like in these tweets from Memphis. From the basketball team, the Grizzlies, we'd like to report a crime. And then the police department, our Memphis in May division will look into it. Memphis in May is their barbecue fest. And then there's this from the mayor, Bless their hearts. You get the gist. Even the Washington Post has a headline. Vice claimed Brooklyn barbecue was world famous. Now it is in the worst possible way. It doesn't help that the photo accompanying the article makes our barbecue look a bit like a school lunch from hell high. So Brooklyn, is your ego writing checks that your port can't cash? I'll just say this. I'm serving barbecue at my wedding this year, and as much as I love BK, not one rack of ribs is coming from anywhere around here, nor with espresso in its rub. On the show today, Jarrett Murphy is back with an effort to find out if the 11th congressional seat is truly in play for Democrats in the coming midterms. And a conference in Brooklyn is assessing the state of black literature. We'll hear all about it. But first, some things. It's almost 10 years ago to the day that the New York Times broke a story about then-Governor Elliot Spitzer and his use of an elite escort service, the Emperor's Club VIP. He was their infamous client number nine. Within a week, the scandal led to his resignation. As the state's attorney general, Spitzer had been notorious as a crusader against corruption, so this indiscretion was a death blow to his tenure. After trying vainly to resurrect his political career, Spitzer is now overseeing a $700 million residential project on the South Williamsburg waterfront. He traded politics for the family development business. Then there's a man who traded a family development business, sort of, for politics, whose middle name is also John. It's been almost two months since the Stormy Daniels story broke, but Trump never claimed to be a paragon of virtue. And though it was extramarital, he didn't technically pay Miss Daniels for her services. He just offered to. And his lawyer then did, to hush her up, allegedly. Man, a lot can change in a decade. The queens of kings need a little help to bring their bishops, rooks, and knights to Chicago. That is the bed All-Girls Chess Club, queens of chess in Kings County have been invited to compete in the Girls' National Chess Championship in April. But they're short on the cash they need to cover expenses like airfare and food. They've set up a piggybacker page for crowdfunding. The club, just a couple of years old, aims to empower young girls through the game of chess, while developing their ability to strategize both on and off the board. And an update on Martin Shkreli and his Wu-Tang Clan album, which we care about more than Martin Shkreli. Shkreli is the infamous Brooklyn Pharma bro who, was ra who raised by 200% the cost of a life-saving drug and who was convicted last year of fraud for misleading investors while running a hedge fund. 
He paid $2 million for the only copy of a Wu-Tang Clan album, Once Upon a Time in Shaolin, and a judge has ordered that he must forfeit it, along with a Picasso painting he owns and a Lil Wayne album. He also must pay $5 million that he posted for bail. When he's sentenced this coming Friday in Brooklyn Federal Court, he'll face up to 20 years in prison. Coming up, Jarrett Murphy and our first guest. U.S. congressional races in New York City tend to be sleepy affairs. Democrats dominate voter registration in most districts, so the general election is usually no contest. Competitive primaries are rare. Five of the city's reps have been in office for a quarter century. The exception is the 11th district, which covers Staten Island and Bay Ridge, Bath Beach, Diker Heights, and parts of Bensonhurst here in Brooklyn. In the past decade, a Republican incumbent was undone by scandal. The Democrat who replaced him lasted just one term. The Republican who took the post then went to federal prison, and the current occupant, Republican Daniel Donovan, finds himself trying to navigate the impact of President Trump's policies on New York City. Now, some Democrats think they have a shot at taking the office this year in the national push to flip the House blue. Leading that charge is Democrat Max Rose, who joins us now. Max, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much uh, for having me. Give us the elevator pitch when you meet an old lady on the street in Staten Island. <laughs> who are you and why are you running for Congress? Sure, sure. So my name is Max Rose as you well know, and I'm the first post-9-11 combat veteran to run for office in New York City history. I'm a Staten Islander, and first and foremost, ahead of being a Democrat, I'm disgusted with the politics that we see today. It's not only locked in gridlock, but when it's not, all they're doing is giving away money to people who don't need it, wealthy people, corporations, saddling us with debt for multiple generations, targeting New Yorkers in the process, and all the while, the crises that we face, no one is even acknowledging them. No one is doing a thing about them. So this Republican Party, it's got to go. It's got to go. We've got to change representation in this district. And more importantly, we've got to change politics in this country. That's why I'm running. People deserve better representation. They deserve a government that's going to tackle these challenges head on. So you were recently uh, endorsed by the Staten Island Democratic sure. Committee, and you had to miss that because you were doing your National Guard right. service, which you still do regularly. Uh, but talk about your time uh, overseas uh, in, uh, in, in, in uniform. And sure. I guess the question, obviously, is that's something that's, that's mentioned in your bio. It's on your website. How does that change or how does that shape your politics and your approach to this race and potentially this job? Of course. The most important thing is not what I did in combat. You know, I was a Ranger qualified infantry platoon leader. I deployed for about more, more than 10 months in a rural area of southern Afghanistan. I led a combat outpost. But what was important is the soldiers that I saw, the soldiers that I led in combat, because they did the impossible each and every day, just because that's what was asked of them, and they didn't ask for anything in return. And these soldiers, they came from everywhere. Republican, Democrat, gay, straight, dreamer, Citizen, it did not matter. All that mattered was the mission. That's the story of this country. That's our true potential. So in many ways, I'm sick and tired of these soldiers just getting thanked for their service. That's the bare minimum. It's about time that in Washington, D.C., that selfless sacrifice, that commitment to results is matched. But a very interesting thing happened to me uh, when my vehicle hit an IED in Afghanistan. First and foremost, my soldiers sprung to action. They did everything right. They called up a nine-line medevac. They got me out of there. But a very interesting thing happened to me when I was lying in a hospital bed. Two-star general comes up to me and he says, son, five years ago, you'd be dead. Now, what he was referring to was the double V-hole underneath my striker, which pushed the explosion away from its core. Two years prior to that, strikers were called Kevlar coffins. Well, Congress finally got their act together. They put partisanship aside, and they dedicated themselves just to saving soldiers' lives. They put the necessary resources towards the problem, and that program, the double V-hole, went from design to implementation in roughly a year. 
This district that you're seeking to represent, it actually has a Democratic majority. They, it does. Uh, they outnumbered Republicans like three to two. But it has this reputation, this history, as, as being a red district in the city. Why is that? You know, it's, it's interesting. It's an interesting question, because roughly the registration ratio is five to three, Democrat to Republican. Furthermore, there's just as many locally elected Democrats as locally elected Republicans. I think what the issue is, first and foremost, is that there's a trust barrier. National Democrats are not trusted. They're viewed as elitist. They're viewed as saying one thing in one room and another thing in another room. And you know what? That's supported by some elements of our history. Things like the carried interest loophole being propped up by both political parties. Also, people have lost faith in the federal government's ability to accomplish anything. So here the Democratic Party is saying, I want the federal government to get things done. And many people, Democrats and Republicans alike, don't think the federal government can accomplish what it once did. They are so deeply nostalgic for the Interstate Highway Act, so deeply nostalgic for the Apollo Project. They want to see that yet again. That's why I go back to that story of when my vehicle hit the IED, because government is capable of so much more. That's the story of this country, confronting challenges head on and overcoming them. So the Democratic Party has got to think big again. The Democratic Party has got to go back to being Democrats again, and we've got to earn voters' trust again. That's a big part of my campaign. Once we accomplish that, we're going to win in a landslide, because the Democratic policies on its face, pro-union, pro-sustainable economic growth, pro-middle class, that has a lot of support on Staten Island and Southern Brooklyn. But the Democratic Party has firmly got to be behind those policies. Uh, let's talk about the Republicans you might face in the sure. race. Uh, former Congressman Michael Grimm is challenging the incumbent Daniel Donovan in a Republican primary that sure. will take place most likely in June. Uh, right now, you don't face a primary opponent, but you, you potentially could. Um, does your race change depending on who is on the Republican side? Dan Donovan is the incumbent. Is he the same as Michael Grimm? Is he the same as mm -hmm. Donald Trump? What is his record like? Sure. So those two are going to fight it out. And they have a vicious primary. We have no idea who's going to win this. And there's also the potential that this could be a three-way race, with one person on the conservative line and another on the Republican. Let's first talk, though, about how these two are exactly the same. They both had a chance to change Washington, D.C. Michael Grimm was a congressman for four years. Dan Donovan has been one for just over three. They both take significant amounts of corporate PAC money. I have said that I am not taking one cent of corporate PAC money, not just during this race, but for the duration of my political career in Congress. The duration. Both of them will say one thing in district, and then they'll go back to Washington, D.C., and they'll listen to their lobbyists, they'll listen to their corporate PAC donors, and they'll act accordingly. They'll do everything to preserve corporate tax loopholes. They'll do everything to give money away to rich people and not to invest in our future. They haven't done a thing to achieve a generation-long infrastructure project. It's just rhetoric about the opioid epidemic. We need a dedication of resources. We need a real plan, and we need leadership. I haven't seen that from either of them. Now, when it comes to Dan Donovan, we have not seen any leadership from him. None whatsoever. Not on one issue. And everybody agrees what the problems are that Staten Islanders face. One of the longest commuting times in America. We all agree the challenges that Southern Brooklynites face, an MTA that does not serve their needs. We have more people dying from overdoses in my district than car accidents. Something's got to be done. And there's a precedent for this. Look at what we did at the height of the HIV AIDS crisis, a full dedication of resources at the federal, state, and city level. Now, it's just rhetoric, and it's just rhetoric from the both of them. The obvious question for someone running for Congress, especially who's going to be a junior member or a freshman member, mm -hmm. is you'll be one of 435. You might be in the minority. Some of the issues you've just talked about, MTA is a, is a state and a local issue. The feds don't have any direct uh, oversight over that. How will you actually make a difference, especially changing what seems like you're talking about, the culture of Washington? That's a, that's a big target. Sure. There is no reason why we cannot have some level of bipartisan support for things like a generation-long infrastructure project. There are six million jobs today that we cannot fill because we don't have the trained workers to fill them. So when you talk about a generation-long infrastructure project, it's not just making our roads and our bridges the envy of the world like they once were. But we could talk about a truly transformative smart grid system. We could talk about training programs and apprenticeship programs that push skilled workers into the private sector. The federal government can play an active role in that. Let's also talk about gun reform, though. This is an issue that's front and center right now. Everybody wants something done. 80, 90 percent of Americans 
When I go to Congress as someone who carried an AR-15 or the military variant in combat, I know that weapon intimately, and I can say resoundingly, on day one, that it should never be sold in America. Never. But that's just the beginning. We need comprehensive background checks. This is something, both of those points that I just made, to say nothing of investing truly in countering the opioid epidemic so we don't lose one more person to an overdose. Those things, if we're willing to approach them with the quintessentially American character, that commitment to actually overcoming challenges and achieving results, we can get that done down in Washington, D.C. I've got the full faith that we can do it. I wouldn't be running if I didn't think we could do this. Right now, uh, Congressman Donovan has a substantial amount of money, uh, substantially more than you do. Uh, you have 400000 or so. I think he has 700000 something around mm -hmm. there. Do you want, do you need the support of the National Party uh, to come in and look at this and say, this is a seat we can flip? And what will it take for you to convince people that, that it is, that you have an actual shot at this? Sure. So in the six months that I have been in this race, I've outraised Dan Donovan in that six months. And he's going to be shocked by what we report next quarter. So there's no doubt that we're going to raise more than Dan Donovan or Michael Grimm. But you can't buy this race. That's important to note. If you don't have a message that resonates, if there's not a campaign with a narrative that resonates, and you, if you don't have the energy to be out there early in the morning, late at night, then no amount of money is going to win this thing. So I'm confident we have all those things. And then we're going to raise the resources needed to push that message out. Now, when it comes to national Democrats, they're not going to win this race either. They can only lose it. Time and again, they come into this race with their high-powered consultants and absolutely no knowledge of what's going on, and they run a cookie-cutter race, and it fails time and again. I have said over and over again that any type of DCCC red to blue designation and $3 will get you on the subway. Nothing more. So this is a locally run race with local support. That's what's so critical. That's why Dan Donovan and Michael Grimm are so afraid of me. So we, uh, we are totally, totally prepared to win. Let me ask you about uh, the role of your service in informing your policies, your positions when it comes to foreign policy. Your sure. website mentions national leadership. As a member of Congress, you might be asked, especially as a veteran, to weigh on things like when it's appropriate to go to war, um, how the United States should conduct itself overseas. Um, what are your positions on that? Was the Iraq war a mistake? What do you think about how we handled Afghanistan? What are the lessons you take on that front? Sure, of course. It's a great question. I think that the invasion of Iraq was the most egregious foreign policy mistake in American history, plain and simple. Now, with that being said, I do believe that we need to fully, fully engage with the world. That doesn't just mean the military. If we want to counter these incredibly complex threats that we face in the 21st century today, whether it's North Korea or foreign extremism of many different variants, then we have got to engage with the world on all fronts, the State Department, foreign aid, the military. This administration is seeking to cut our State Department by 30 percent. That's not just stupid. That's really poor national security policy. It's going to make us less safe. So when I deployed to Afghanistan, I saw firsthand that if we want to truly establish stability, if we want to protect ourselves both overseas and here at home, it's not always a bullet that's going to do it. You've got to engage with people. You have to earn their trust. You have to go with all you, everything that you have to include agents of economic development and the State Department. It's all so vitally important. So that's what the 21st century national security policy of the United States needs to look like. This is not the time for isolationism. It's also not the time for overt military engagements that are counterintuitive in nature. Uh, Max Rose uh, will be inviting Mr. Grimm and Donovan uh, on the show. And uh, you have a long raise ahead of you. I'm sure we'll have you back as well. But thanks very much for coming on. Thank you so much again. Thank you. How does literature help to build black America's cultural history? How do black writers today reflect and affect that culture? And how do they advance the fight against social injustice and inequality? Just some of the key questions to be addressed later this month at the 14th annual conference hosted by the Center for Black Literature at Medgar Evers College. 
Over three days, from March 22nd to the 25th, the theme will be Gathering at the Waters, Healing, Legacy, and Activism in Black Literature. And here with more are Clarence Reynolds, the center's director. Thanks for coming on 112 Thank you so much for having me. And Keisha Gay Anderson, an author. Great to have you here, Keisha. Great to be here. So can we just start really quickly? You guys, I, I'm feeling really bad because I didn't know a whole lot about this conference yeah. before it came on my radar for mm -hmm. the show. So I was wondering, can you just tell me a little bit about the National Black Writers Conference? What's the vision and the theme for this year, Clarence? Well, the National Black Writers Conference began, the first one was in 1986. Mm -hmm. uh, it was founded by uh, John Oliver Killens. And the theme then, or the purpose of the conference then, was to establish a dialogue mm -hmm. about this, the responsibility of black writers. Uh, the social responsibility of black writers. This year's conference picks up on that social responsibility again for black writers. Uh, we focus on the theme of how we acknowledge how social injustice and inequality uh, challenges us daily, mm -hmm. and then the ways that black writers use their work and explore their writing in those themes, mm -hmm. and then also the ways that black writers also, I'm sorry, also the way that black writers uh, convey their messages and their narratives mm -hmm. in ways that help us and help to restore just in, not only the individual soul, but also the collective community. And how do you feel about that, Keisha? As a writer, mm -hmm. I know that there are quite a few black writers right now who definitely feel like, wow, <clears throat> this is really our time to say something important, and maybe it's not on the nose political, mm -hmm. but we have to tell stories right now that sort of reflect our feelings about what the culture is giving us, or at least what the country is giving us mm -hmm. at this point. How does that work for you and your art making? Well, I think certainly we stand on a very long tradition of black writers doing this, and I mm -hmm. think the, the difference now is the technology, social media is connecting us and making us aware of more things than we were before. But we stand on the shoulders of a lot of people who have put in a whole lot of work before they could uh, let many, many people know what they were saying. Um, and I do feel now we're interrogating certain issues. Um, there's a comfortability about discussing things openly that perhaps we were more measured about, just given the time and historical context of where we were politically. Mm -hmm. It's a great time to be writing. I think so, yeah. too. Mm -hmm. Clarence, one of the things that struck me immediately is the term, or the phrase, gathering at mm -hmm. the waters. It, for me, you know, raised Baptist, you know, I mm -hmm. tell people all the time, you know, I'm not necessarily practicing, but I'm definitely culturally <laughs> Baptist. Right. Um, I, I think of baptism. I think of what that symbolizes. I think of, you know, the songs of going to the water, not just to be saved, but also to be cleansed, to be clean, to be healed, to be, you know, like moved forward. Is that sort of what you guys That's were going after? That's exactly with there? what we were going after. Mm -hmm. The whole idea of being cleansed and moving forward, and also of the way that literature does that for us or is able to do that. Literature has that function of. Uh, establishing uh, historical, cultural, and political uh, messages. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to do that through this conference. Right. I love that. I just, I'm very, very into that. And Keisha, do you have some work that sort of ties into that thing? Well, funny you should ask. Funny I should ask. <laughs> my, uh, the title of my first poetry collection is Gathering the Waters. Mm -hmm. So I feel this is really um, a great time to, this is my second time participating in this conference. but. Mm -hmm. Definitely the meaning and what I intended with that work is the same thing, mm -hmm. is about um, keeping the good things and washing away what we don't need anymore, letting go of things that no longer serve us. And I feel that this is a really important time now that we have had people who have revealed our history to us, told us we have had a history, we can, you know, we, we know about the civil rights movement. Now I feel like it's time to go inside mm -hmm. and really do that inner work so that we have uh, a healthy way to move forward as complete human beings. That's what I'm concerned with. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you actually, aside from a panel that you're going to be doing at AWP here <laughs> yes. this week, you're, you're also going to be running a panel for this conference as well. I'm going to be teaching a poetry workshop. Poetry workshop. A poetry workshop. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about how that works with the workshops? Well, we have several workshops. We have a, a fiction workshop. We have a book proposal workshop. Mm -hmm. We have a poetry workshop. And we're also going to have a book publishing workshop. Wow. The workshops are designed to give 
writers who, I would say, um, up-and-coming writers, ideas of what some of the challenges are that they may have uh, in terms of, like, finding an agent, f what their book or their poem may entail. Mm -hmm. And the workshops will help you develop those sorts of things that are necessary to move your book project forward. Mm -hmm. So we're happy to have Keisha um, do the poetry workshop once again. She's done one once with us before. And uh, we have several wonderful uh, writers who are going to be handling the fiction workshops. Uh, yeah. Victor Laval and Nicole Dennis Ben oh are going to be handling the fiction workshops for us. And my faves! Yeah, so my faves, I love them well. both. So, sure. so that, and those are just some of the names of some of the writers who are going to be at this conference. I'm really excited about it. I love that. You know, so here's my, you know, uh, my question that I'm very, very excited about. I'm a comic book fiend, okay. and I have been for <laughs> many years. Would you guys consider, especially given, I mean, look, Black Panther is about to cross a billion at the box office. Mm -hmm. Some really big names have been writing in the yes. graphic universe, black names. ta Hesse Coates is writing for Black Panther. He's also going to be writing the new Captain America. Mm -hmm. Roxanne Gay wrote World of Wakanda. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, are you guys thinking maybe to bring in some more of these young yes, emerging are. people? Yes, we are. We can get something like that going on. Oh, we are totally giving it some thought because as yeah. we move forward with the conference, each conference builds on the previous one. Mm -hmm. So as we take on new uh, issues, of course, that is a topic and theme that we we'll mm -hmm. definitely will address in, in upcoming conferences. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Now, final question. When and where? I'm a person who's interested <laughs> in the conference. I want to register. I want to sign up specifically for Keisha's workshop. <laughs> yes, please. How do I do that? Well, you can visit our website first, uh, mm -hmm. www.centerforblackliterature.org. Mm -hmm. The conference takes place at Meg Rivers College in Brooklyn. In the Founders Auditorium, uh, thir begins Thursday, March the 22nd, which is our Community Day, which we have an Elders Writing Program. Pro program. We have a Youth Literacy Program that's taking place, and that's being conducted by Cheryl and Wade Hudson of Just Us Books. Wow. So that's going to be fantastic for young kids from elementary school to middle school. Mm -hmm. Then conference continues on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And on Friday, we have our tribute and awards program mm -hmm. in which we recognize some of the most important writers that have helped to shape mm -hmm. the way that we look at literature and the way that literature has helped to build build us. Are any of them going to be there? Yes, all of them are going to be there. All of them are going to be there. We're going to have Colson Whitehead. Oh, wow. We're going to have Tanana Reeve Dew and Stephen mm -hmm. Barnes, mm -hmm. Susan L. Taylor, mm -hmm. David Levering Lewis, wow. Kwame Dawes, and we're also going to have Eugene B. Redmond. Wow. This sounds amazing. So that's going to be on Saturday evening, the Tribute and Awards program. But it goes until Sunday. And it Sunday's goes until Sunday day. as well, yes. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for coming thank and you. for letting people know about this. I think that it's mm -hmm. going to hopefully make a big difference. I want everybody oh, to show sure up for this mm -hmm. conference. So do we. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you so much for having us. Thanks for joining us today. Tomorrow on the show, the Working Families Party and its efforts to dismantle the Independent Democratic Conference. We'll learn how to slay and the urban arts movement of high arts. Hope you can join us. Mm -hmm.